But if you were to ask me, it's like, what is one of the, the keys to selling the project? It's knowing your audience and be able to speak to the experience in which they're ultimately driving. Business of Architecture, episode 222. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architecture and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. On today's episode of the Business of Architecture, you'll get to listen in as I talk with Keith Houchin. He's a project designer and associate at SB Architects. In today's episode, you're going to get some tips about how to choose the right rendering firm for all those architectural visualizations you're doing. Keith is going to share his top three lessons that he's learned over his career about the business of architecture. He also shares the SB Architects process for kicking off a project on the right foot. In addition, at the very end of today's episode, he's going to share... A strategy and a specific story where they were able to win a project coming in even though they were the underdog. So without further ado, here's my interview with Keith Houchin. Keith Houchin, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thanks for having me. So give me an overview of the job roles and responsibilities that you have at SB Architects. So at SB, I'm a project designer. So I'm one of the lead designers in our hospitality uh, division. So we, um, we like to focus on kind of our multifamily, mixed use, um, kind of custom residential, but I really focus on the hospitality portion. And then on top of that, I go into some of the technical um, kind of computer aspects. So CAD, BIM, rendering, computational design, and um, some of the graphics workflow and branding. So when you say computational design, what does that amount to? What is that? So um, one of the things that I've brought with me to the company is a means of automating and starting to analyze some of our early phase work, um, utilizing software to be able to make our lives easier. Um, it's something that we're still a small firm, so I would say it's, it's very fledgling in what we do, but um, I like to use tools like Grasshopper and Dynamo to help kind of expedite some of the things that we use to stay flexible and nimble. Describe to me, what are Grasshopper and Dynamo? Um, They are visual programming languages uh, for software. So Grasshopper is through Rhino and um, Dynamo is through Revit. So in in a lot of ways, and in the really large scale projects, you can use them for automation of fabrication, for uh, large scale analysis of complex geometry. Um, And then you can also automate kind of more simple modeling tasks. Um, I would say at, at SB, we try to use all the tools that we have available um, to, so that we can best service our clients. Well, it sounds like you have a broad range of things that you're involved in in the firm there. Yeah, I like, to, I like to keep my fingers in a little bit of everything. And out of all the different things that you're involved in, which are you most excited about personally? Um, I, I think for me, it's the things that really get our clients excited. So it's a lot of the, the rendering and more experiential um, deliverables that we do. Um, so the virtual reality work, the kind of cohesive concept packages, the branding packages that we put forward, um, the things that really just get both us and our clients excited about the projects and keep them moving forward. And what are clients getting most excited about? You know, I, it really depends on, on the project. Um, I think a lot of our clients are keen on finding something unique, something different. How do they set themselves apart from the rest of their market? Um, particularly in hospitality, it's incredibly um, competitive amongst all the various brands, whether it's, it's a large scale brand or a, a boutique property. And everyone's trying to get a piece of the pie. 
And in that, it can be very difficult to define what is unique and special about each of these individual projects. So one of the things that we do, I think very successfully, is starting to really take a look at the project, build consensus among the client team, the project teams, um, and really try to find that unique aspect that makes a project special. Can you give me some examples of projects that you've been involved with in the past that had that differentiation that the clients were excited about? Um, let's see. And I, I would say the, the difficult thing with hospitality is so many of these can be speculative. But um, I know uh, Teresa in her podcast mentioned University Village. That was one of the renderings that was behind her. That was a large mixed use project that was in Boca Raton, Florida. And I think one of the defining aspects of that was really creating this pedestrian realm in an area that was generally suburban. Um, so really looking at it from an urban standpoint and how, how do people experience the space? I think that's one of the things that translates from hospitality throughout our entire practice. Um, that's really the focal point um, is thinking about the user experience and how they move through the various aspects of it. Uh, Keith, what are you seeing in terms of the cutting edge in terms of architectural visualization? What, what's interesting about the architectural visualization is there's more and more software and plugins that are being developed that try to be a one-off um, kind of our whole solution to uh, an architect's visualization needs. And what we found is we can utilize a lot more of those, whether it's uh, real-time rendering, similar to what Lumion uses, or uh, there's another one that we're using called uh, Inkscape. Um, but when it really comes down to trying to sell something um, in a very specific way, we still like to use a lot of other uh, third-party rendering companies and really treat them as part of the design team. Um, so the, the companies that will, they almost act as their own branding and, and marketing companies. Um, with that type of collaboration, we can, we can choose what's right for a project. A lot of our smaller scale projects, um, we really like to have fun with it in-house. And for a lot of the, the large scale, kind of very uh, high profile projects, we like to knock it over the park and spend a little money to, to get it visualized professionally. Architects that may be listening or firm owners or people who want to get renderings done. I mean, there's a wide range of companies out there because I've worked with them in the past. Everything from the guys who do 250 bucks who are in China to firms in China that do a couple thousand bucks an image and do incredible work and yeah. domestic, international. Give me the kind of the range of the spectrum. If, if an architect came to you and said, okay, Keith, you've done this for a while. Uh, with your experience, what are my options for getting some renderings done at different price points and different levels of quality? You know, that, that's actually something that we've started to do with some of our clients is give them these tiers of um, kind of service level. So like you said, there, there are companies that you can get pretty affordable renderings out of China and elsewhere for anywhere from $500 to $1,000 um, for decent quality work. Um, the, the thing to think about for those types of renderings is the amount of effort on your side to coordinate them. I think that's something that's always underestimated is if you're, if you're going for what would be more of a bargain budget side, um, expect to spend more time on your end to really get the quality that you want. I think there's a good kind of middle tier um, also in that international kind of consultant list that can give you better results. Um, that still requires a little effort on your part. Um, that usually hovers around the thousand to $2,000 range per image, that depending on scope and scale and complexity. And then you get to the really high ends that can be upwards of five, six, seven thousand dollars an image, depending on what you're trying to do, who you're working with, um, and number of renderings. So I've, I, I can say I've worked with companies that hit that full spectrum. I think a lot of times we find ourselves somewhere in the middle um, for what our clients are expecting, at least for the hospitality projects, because they're a little larger scale. And I think that. What's fun for us is the smaller projects, so maybe some of the custom homes or the wineries that we work on uh, within the office, we actually get to use um, our own talents. So we have a number of people in the office that really enjoy doing these types of visualizations. Um, and it gives them a, a chance to really kind of stretch their um, rendering muscles and, and do something cool. What's your workflow in the office in terms of your technology stack that you use for the drawings and the 3D renderings? So um, it's very much choose the right tool for the right job. We have a pretty wide um, 
skill set amongst our staff. Personally, I, I'm a big pro proponent of doing things kind of loose and fast in the beginning, starting to build up a, a 3D model. And I usually work in Rhino for that. And then translate that either into uh, Lumion or V-Ray for in-house uh, visualizations or then export that out to um, a third-party consultant. And then from there, it's really about scope. Um, how far are we taking the project? If we're going to go to a full um, architectural set, we're going to start to transition that into Revit or a BIM platform so that we can start to document it. Um, and we've tried to do that sooner rather than later, but it, it really comes down to the complexity and, and client management. Um, a lot of the clients that we deal with can be very involved and are very passionate about the projects. And that can also create a very cyclical design cycle. So making sure that when we tran transfer into the more, um, not necessarily cumbersome, but requires more effort to build up the information, uh, we want to make sure that the major decisions have been made and it's more about refinement. Okay. And have you guys ever done any, uh, well, exporting out of Revit, you know, rendering directly from that platform? Well, uh, right now, uh, we are rendering directly out of Revit for some of our more developed projects. Um, that plugin, Inscape, that I mentioned, has a direct uh, connection, and so does Lumion. What I like about um, Lumion in that sense is the library, the entourage that it has. So you can create that real link between the environments, and you're not necessarily bogging your Revit model down with um, kind of landscape geometry and, and all of that extra information. Um, so that, that's been kind of fun to see those being developed and, and pushed forward. Hey, define entourage for me. People might not be familiar with that. Okay, so in, anything that, that fills in the life of, of the architectural project. So the architectural project will be the, uh, your, your floors, your roof, your walls, uh, anything that makes up the building. And then the entourage is everything that actually gives it um, feeling. So your, your landscape, your uh, furniture, your people, dogs, grass, clouds, um, all of the things that the rest of the environment is made up of. Awesome. Now you did your, you were telling me before we started the interview here that you did your undergraduate over here at Cal Poly here on the California coast, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And then you did a master's degree in Spain at, well, tell me about that. Tell me about that process. What prompted you to go internationally to Spain uh, to pursue architecture? And then what'd you learn in that degree? So um, what was interesting about that experience um, I'd been working for a number of years at that point, and I knew I wanted to go continue my education, but I wasn't necessarily convinced that a, a master's of architecture was going to give me anything more than my undergraduate degree gave me. So uh, when I pursued my graduate education, it was more in business, and the program that I found was a master of architectural management and design. So it really focused more on the business aspects, the management aspects, and starting to create collaborations and communications amongst teams. Um, so with my design skill set of undergrad and my working experience, I got to pair that and really build up my soft skills and kind of business savvy to help better execute uh, professionally. Okay, well, uh, Keith, you're aware this is the business of architecture <laughs> show. So what insights have you learned during your career about the business side of architecture that you can share with us? Um. Like that, that's such a broad question. It uh, is. I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you <laughs> narrow it in on some one or two top takeaways. I, I think number one of this is the team. How do you build relationships both internally and externally um, with your team? And I think that the clients are part of that team. I think all of the consultants are part of that team. And how do you get everyone on the same page um, to be able to move things forward? Cause I, I think how that's, do you do that. Um, I, it's, it's communication. It's being able to make sure that everyone understands what the goals are, um, what they're looking for, what the expectations are. I think working internationally, um, there's a language barrier sometimes. So culturally, making sure that you understand what um, the various parties are all working towards and perspectives and viewpoints. Um, how do they work? It's almost putting yourself in their shoes. Um, I think from a, a business standpoint, being able to build those relationships and trust um, is really the key to creating successful projects. And what have you found to be successful strategies for building that team, that communication? 
one of the things that we use within our design process, I'll, I'll use kind of a project specific one um, rather than the, the broad scale of just offering services uh, timely and being really responsive and nimble to the, the client's needs is we like to go through this workshop exercise at the beginning of our design um, that has nothing to do with the solution and has everything to do with just making sure that everyone understands and creates this almost milestone document to go back to and refer to. So it's a series of, of dot polling where we'll throw um, a whole slew of words um, up on a large sheet of paper and we'll have um, red dots that everyone has with one red dot that they can go pin up against of what they think really captures the essence of a project. So whether it's luxury or whether it's rustic, um, whether it's um, kind of contemporary or more traditional, we, we can start to set up these exercises that let us as the team get an understanding of where everyone th is interpreting the brief, um, the goals, and it, it gives us a guide so that from the very beginning, we can start the process with an understanding that sometimes can be missed if you just start a project kind of from out of the blue um, with only the RFP of the, the programmatic requirements. You're not really thinking about what the end goals, um, either experiential wise or aesthetically wise or what the client really expects because what um, your client or your team might interpret um, one specific word, you may interpret in a complete, completely different way. And I think we as architects sometimes take for granted that the, the verbiage that we use to describe projects might have completely different meanings to people that aren't familiar with it. Mm. And how about communication? I mean, you, obviously that is a form of communication. They're having that, that kind of group workshop slash charrette. What ways do you find uh, help facilitate the communication throughout the project? Uh, a lot of times it's, it's things like this. So using zoom or go to meeting to have um, regular calls, um, we like to have a lot of in-person meetings if we can. Uh, if it's local, it's less an issue. Internationally, we try to time them at regular intervals so that we can constantly keep touch and keep uh, moving things forward, making sure that we're steering the project in the direction that everyone is, is looking to achieve. Um, I think it's about being transparent and about being honest. Um, we, we as architects and designers um, have a very thick skin and, and letting the clients know that if for whatever reason, something that we have designed may not be fitting their expectations to, to tell us. And we also um, try to hold a firm line that when a client asks us to do something that we feel is inappropriate for what they're asking for, um, we won't just sit there and draw it. I think that's the other thing that can be um, troublesome in a service industry is this desire to make uh, your client happy and just kind of perform tasks uh, from a developer or, or someone else, but really making sure that you're keeping the, the goals and the heart of the project in mind through all aspects of it. Does a situation come to mind where you had to take a line like that that may have been uncomfortable? Actually, yeah, th this just happened uh, a few weeks ago where we're working on a project right now um, in the US that's a, a fairly large mixed use project. And um, the client, we, we really enjoy working with these clients. They've been very open-minded for the most part, we're, but we're getting to the point where our concept is really becoming a reality. Um, they're working through their pro forma, their marketing. Um, we're trying to get consultants on board with all the coordination. And there's a level of expectation in terms of certain physical constraints. So for instance, like hallway widths um, and door drops within a, a hospitality design. Now these clients have never necessarily worked on a hospitality. They've done a lot of other development and their idea of what kind of a minimum requirement is, is very different than what a brand would say expect. So for a number of weeks, we've had this ongoing uh, discussion as to about, well, do we keep the hallway at the width that we've designed it or reduce it down to code minimum because that gives them more sellable square footage, that type of thing. And we had to continue to tell them that, listen, you're, you're getting a price premium on your product because it's a higher level of service, it's a higher level of expectation. If you start to reduce this down to what the bare minimum was, you're not longer gonna be able to get that price premium. So through this, not necessarily painful, but um, very rigorous debate, we managed to convince them that what we designed was appropriate and we got to move on to the next thing. 
but it's um, little things like that that uh, I find also with uh, mechanical placements. So where do you end up putting um, your mechanical plants within projects? Uh, oftentimes, if something is overlooked or a requirement that was never dictated before needs to be implemented, they're like, well, we just put it in the, the easiest place possible. Well, what's the guest experience? Why would someone really want to have a cooling tower right there at your front door? No, not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that. I recently stayed at a hotel in Waco, Texas. I was out there speaking at a conference for the Texas Society of Architects on effective marketing strategies for architects. But anyways, I stayed at this hotel. That was a. It was a one of the nicer hotels there in Waco, which is an interesting town. Um, but it was kind of the standard Holiday Inn kind of hospitality layout, right? Where they have the double loaded corridors, yep. uh, the big lobby downstairs with the taller ceiling plate. Um, a nice seating area. But one thing that I thought was really impressive about this particular hotel was they took that standard kind of franchise hotel model. But then when you, um, first of all, they had floor to ceiling glass down below in the lobby, which was really impressive and pretty, pretty nice. But then you go into the rooms and they say everything's bigger in Texas. And I mean, I used to live there, so I can, I can say that, but I mean, it's definitely true with this hotel because I would, the room was enormous and you could literally like lay in a plan in there, a plane, you know, you felt like you were sitting in this luxurious penthouse suite, even though it was like a standard king size room, you know, and the hallways were extra wide as well. So it is interesting that, um, you know, as architects, this is a good example of how design decisions can influence the perceived value of a property. And of course, you know, I'd be a lot more willing to stay at a place like that and have that kind of comfort than a competitor that might have smaller, more constrained spaces. So thanks for bringing up that. That's an excellent example, Keith. Yeah. And I mean, it, it really goes back, um, to what I said in the beginning is this kind of user experience. And um, I think coming from a, a hospitality standpoint, it's, it's interesting to have those types of conversations with clients um, or even other designers that come from maybe more of a commercial or residential background. Um, because some of the constraints that we take, like that I would take for granted, just saying that the, this is the expectation of the guests that are going to be staying here. Others don't necessarily have. So, I think this is kind of a broader conversation within the design fields of educating um, clients and your teams to kind of look at the perspective of who's going to be using the space, how are they going to be using the space, and what's the expectation. So the way you design a kind of three-star, three-and-a-half-star business hotel is very different than how you design a five-star plus luxury resort somewhere. So we talked a little bit about you identified teamwork communication as some of your key business insights. Has any other, any other business insights come to mind, Keith, that you've seen in your career? I think one of the other things that, that really has lended itself to be successful is staying flexible. Um, it, it can be kind of a gray area. It's how do you respond to changing constraints in a project because they're, they're constantly going to evolve. Um, oftentimes we'll have multiple calls with clients in a single week. So setting up your staffing, setting up your workflow in a way that keeps you flexible, I think is key to being able to respond to all of these constant changes. One of the, the things on the technology side that I often get into debates with some of our other staff with is when do you start to utilize BIM? Um, and for us, for the larger scale projects, it can be very cumbersome to try to put all of that information into BIM right from the get-go, from the, the conceptual level. Um, from a coordination and documentation side, it works great. You're able to pull all of your documents directly out of it and it works. But when the client hasn't actually made the decisions um, in terms of whole scale program, unit mix changes, core locations, like very, very large moves, it can be very difficult to keep up with that um, in an environment that requires a lot more information. So I think, um, Setting up your workflow within your practice to be able to maintain the level of flexibility you need to be able to achieve the project goals and your clients goals is really key. So that doesn't burden you with extra staff hours um, and extra effort to be able to realize the project. And so how does that get implemented, maintaining that flexibility? I think in many ways it's, on a case by case basis, it's being able to interpret what the project needs are. Um, from, from my standpoint, in terms of like an actual workflow, it's being able to 
utilize the front end and until that consensus is built, until, until those decisions are made, keeping the designs in a more loose fashion, not trying to rush into a more rigid framework. So hand sketches, uh, single line CAD, kind of loose 3D massing models, get all of the parts and pieces in the right spot. Um, if you need to visualize it in a way that gets people excited, really sells the experience to help lock down those decisions. And then you can start to move forward into more of the, the detailed areas. Um, I think sometimes it's easy for us as architects to get focused on these details and want to execute and really, really think through everything. But I think there's a certain level of um, ambiguity that you almost need to take at the beginning of the project just to make sure that the, the macro level decisions are really being focused and determined. And then you can start to get into those specifics. Now, you did mention flexible staffing. How have you seen that implemented? It's, it's interesting, um, and I would say SB is very different than, let's say, some of the other companies that I've worked for in that way. Um, our front-end design effort, so until that consensus is built, is really um, staffed very lean. Um, there's usually only maybe one to two people um, really focusing on it to try to drive kind of the, the concepts and the vision home to be able to build that consensus. And then as we start to develop a project, we can start to build a team around um, that, those various designers. So if you look at a typical time frame for a, a project, so from master planning through construction documents, construction administration, that concept and early schematic level, or even at a master planning level, depending on the size and scope, um, is really left to just kind of be one person um, with support where needed. So whether it's graphics help that comes in kind of towards the end, whether we start to bring um, a team to help build 3D models, um, and then really start to build the regular team once those decisions are made. Keith, what is one question that I haven't asked you that you think I should have asked you? Hmm, one question that you haven't asked. That's a, that is a good question. I think you've been pretty, pretty broad on this, actually, way more than, than I expected necessarily coming into it. So this has been good. I think um, overall, like, and, and maybe I'm just going to answer the question because I haven't formed it fully in my head, but the, the key to, I think, our design success is really selling the experience of the project. I know I've spoken about that earlier, but if you were to ask me, it's like, what is one of the, the keys to selling the project? It's knowing your audience and be able to speak to the experience in which they're ultimately driving. So through all that communication, through the consensus building, through being flexible and being able to learn um, kind of the needs of the client and being able to respond to the, the various changes, it really comes down to selling the experience and, and knowing the audience in which you're, you're kind of moving um, your goal towards. Can you give me an example of how you've sold the experience and identified with your audience? So actually, here's an example of a, a project that we're currently working on. When um, we went to go pitch for the project, um, it's an international resort uh, kind of beach location. We were invited very late to the proposal and we were competing against, uh, I believe, six, five or six other companies um, from all over the world. And we went there and the, these other companies had had a, a significant amount of time to compete in this invited competition, come up with a solution. And um, we went into it knowing we weren't gonna be able to come up with a solution. And we knew that any solution that we did come up with was going to be wrong because we hadn't had a chance to build that consensus, communicate with the client and get an understanding of what they really wanted. So just for the sake of, of the conversation, we drew something and when we presented it, we came up and said, we're going to show you something, but it's completely wrong. And they, they just kind of looked at us and went, what do you mean? It's like, well, we, we haven't had a chance to actually speak to you about your project. How can we come up with a solution that would meet your needs? Um, and I think that, framed us in a way that understood that we were collaborative and wanted to work with them. We weren't going to come in and dictate a solution as a uh, kind of outsider and really build the team around the client group. Um, 
pair that with the experiential aspect of using examples of our previous uh, virtual reality work and, and renderings and really showing them how we build the experience in our designs um, took us to win the project. And it's, it's something that's actively moving forward and we're really excited about. When you talk about creating an experience in and through the design, can you give me an example of what that means? Um, so I think for, for us at the early phases, before we have the built environment, it's putting ourselves in the spaces, um, thinking about how people are going to use the space um, in, in a variety of ways. So we can describe that space visually um, in renderings, we can describe it in animations, we can describe it in virtual reality. And oftentimes we like to pair that with um, these very experiential videos. So it, you have the types of, of imagery and um, motion graphics that can describe a project kind of technically, but we like to go in there and really focus on the lifestyle and the, the use of the space. So for some people, uh, particularly those that aren't architecturally trained, letting them know how spaces can function and be utilized. We did one proposal, for instance, where um, it was a large mixed-use um, center with residential and a hotel, a cinema complex, and office. And the cinema complex we positioned in a way that could be flexible and that the entire cinema could open up into a large public plaza to expand for concerts um, and potentially create this very large auditorium. So you could have this opportunity to have 150 to 200 seat theaters individually. But then during the summer, uh, when the weather's great and you had a lot of people visiting, you could open everything up and host a larger event. Um, and the way we depicted that was through these series of rendered studies that started to blend together. And it was as if the, the seasons were changing. So you got to see that in the winter, if it's snowy, it's kind of closed off and it provides shelter. And then in the, the summer, you get to open it up and it gets to, to breathe and kind of create this really active public space. What, what are you excited about right now at SB Architects? I think the, the great thing that we have going at SB Architects is the, the level and quality of work that we're delivering. Um, our, over the past few years, our brand recognition within at least hospitality um, has risen so much that we're getting a lot of great project opportunities. Um, so we're, we're just really excited to keep designing awesome destinations, awesome experiences, um, and spread across the world. So you said that over the past couple of years, you've seen a big increase in the brand awareness of SB Architects in the hospitality industry. What do you feel has been the key to really growing that exponentially? I think for us, um, it's primarily through our relationships. Having clients that really believe in us and believe in our work who we've worked very well with. But on, on top of that, it's, it's getting our name out there and being um, recognized within uh, hospitality and the mixed use and, and multifamily. So even um, things like this, so this interview right here helps broaden our brand awareness within a certain segment. Um, we're very active in terms of going to various conferences that aren't necessarily with architects, but with clients and developers and other consultants. Because um, I think one of the things that architects can tend to do is kind of just um, socialize within their own circle. And that doesn't necessarily help generate work. So making sure that we're going to the places for the types of work that we want. So whether it's the Alice convention um, for hospitality or whether it's uh, Napa wine conventions to really look at expanding our wine practice. Um, it's the uh, mixed use and multifamily uh, events, um, developer conferences, ULI, all of these other aspects um, help broaden the awareness of what we're doing. Um, and we're still a relatively boutique sized firm um, within the, the broader scheme of things. So it's encouraging that we're competing with the much larger firms very regularly now. Sounds exciting. Well, Keith, hey, thank you for joining us on the Business of Architecture today. It's been a, a great conversation. Thanks for letting us peer into SB Architects and give you some insight of what you've learned through the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. That is a wrap. 
As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.